Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor, and today we're going to be going over the 11.2 support tier list. So as always, if you enjoy the content, please be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps out a ton on the channel. Come by, check out the stream as well. We start every night around 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Usually go till about 3 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Very friendly, chill community. We'd love to have you. And I do fresh patch notes, tier lists, and all kinds of other guides um, constantly updated on the channel. So be sure to check all that out. Okay, let's go ahead and get in here. So I will say, as a disclaimer, I am recording this on Tuesday. The patch notes are not coming out until tomorrow, but on Wednesday, but I am um, starting my classes at the university on Thursday. I teach English at a major American university. So I'm gonna be swamped with stuff all day tomorrow. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and do the tier list. I'm gonna be going off of what Mark Yetter, who's the lead designer, tweeted. And he said that these uh, changes are gonna be for the most part, you know, very, very accurate to what's gonna be on the patch notes. So if anything crazy changes, be sure to check out my patch notes video. I'll do that tomorrow um, once that releases, but I wanna go ahead and try to get this done and get this out there before I get swamped with schoolwork over the first couple of days. Okay, I think it'll be pretty accurate unless there's something just completely crazy out of left field. I think, you know, the position of these champions on the tier list is gonna be about the same, in my opinion. Okay, so just a real quick overview. I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this just so you can kind of know where I'm coming from and what I'm thinking about when I'm making this tier list, and then we'll get down there into the list itself. So I think we're in a relatively quick meta. It's only one or two items most of the time, so that means that enchanters are going to be a little bit weaker. They don't have as much AP. They don't have as much healing. And then tanks are going to be a little bit stronger just because they have um, higher base stats, and usually they have higher instances of CC which is gonna be much more useful when everyone else has lower stats. So um, I think that's gonna favor the tanks. ADCs in general are pretty volatile, so you need to try to get ahead early. Um, they're not gonna get as many items a lot of times if they don't get ahead early, and a lot of the top ADCs right now do not have a lot of utility, so if they fall behind, it's gonna be rough. So some of the most played stuff, like your veins, your Kaisas, things like that are not gonna have that much utility. So you really want to try to get them ahead uh, early on. There's very low engage in CC and other roles, right? So if you look at mid, almost everything, a lot of the popular picks are going to be assassins, right? So you don't start to get any kind of like CC or control till you get down to Anivia, whatever that is, like the 10th one down. Galio is very good, but he's much further down as well. So lots of assassins in mid, lots of high damage junglers. Hecarim does have engage. He's kind of tanky. But a lot of these other champions are going to be lacking on the engage and CC front. And then the same thing with the top lane. You do have Malphite, who's pretty popular. Um, Shen's tanky. He can, you know, help out a little bit. A lot of these are going to be, like, tank-ish. Uh, but there's not going to be as many of those hard engage, you know, CC champs that are going to be as popular right now. So that means that having something with that engage option and something that has, you know, some tankiness and some CC about it uh, in the support role is going to be very useful in a lot of team comps. It's going to enable your jungler to go for one of those power damage picks um, and not have to worry about how y'all are going to engage. Um, Enchanter items are still really weak. They have buffed them a little bit. That did help last patch and they lower the cost on um, the support Enchanter items by 200. That was really useful. But um, Forbidden Idol still feels terrible. I've had people debate this with me, but I, I, it's just worse than it was last season. Losing Ability Haste is a very big deal because that's how Enchanters got some of their power versus tanks, is they had more Ability Haste in the past, right? You'd be able to get pretty much all of your items as an Enchanter had 10% um, Ability Haste on it or uh, CDR on it from past seasons, and your items were way cheaper, right? You could get Redemption for 2100, Athenes for 2100, um, Shirelia's was like 2050, Mikhail's 2100, versus the tank items were more, right? Um, your Knight's Vow was 2300 or 2200, you had Zeke's at 2300, and then, you know, your items outside of that were going to be much, much more expensive a lot of the time, so, um, Enchanters don't have that edge anymore, so their itemization feels a lot weaker. Now it's the tanks who have the ability haste on every item, right? You have, your Zeke's is 20%, your Mythic is 20% now, so you get 40 right there. Versus with Enchanters, a lot of times you want to go Staff of Flowing Water second, which isn't going to have any CDR on it. Yeah, you can play around it a little bit by getting something like Ionian Boots plus your Mythic to kind of even it out a bit. But um, by and large, the itemization is just way more expensive on Enchanters and just some of the stat allocations, especially on Forbidden Idol, feel pretty bad. 
There's lots of ability haste on the tank items, just mentioned that. And then there's just a lot of burst damage as well. Still in the game, items do a hell of a lot of damage and it's just a lot more likely you're gonna get blown up right now. Like there are some really powerful tank items that can mitigate that, like Locket's very strong, and you know, stuff like Sunfire Aegis is still really good, um, Zeke's is pretty good, but a lot of enchanters don't have access to that. Their most powerful items are usually gonna be Staff of Flowing Water and Ardent Sensor. Those have no resists, um, no health, no ability haste. So it feels, you know, it feels like you're very, very squishy if you're getting um, some of the top tier items. So, versus in the past, you know, you could get stuff like Redemption, right, and get a little bit of health, or you could get something like Shirelius, which had a little bit of health on it. Um, I believe. I can't remember the, the, the final iteration and the stats on it from last season, but either way, you're very squishy and you will get blown up a lot of times as Enchanters. And that's why you see Enchanters just across the board. It's not that they're unplayable. It's just that their win rates are far lower on most of them than they have been in the past, right? Janna, historically, has almost always been a 53 or 54%, right? Like, Nami's always been a 52, 53. Sona, historically, 53, 54. All of these champs are down, like, 2% at least from where they were in the past. Um, and the tanks have been kind of neutralized as well. A lot of them have been. Um, you know, down to like the, the 51, 50%. So it's not like the tanks are like way more powerful, but they've all been kind of brought down to an equilibrium around like the 50 or 51%, which is okay. It's just the problem is it's like, all right, so there are still a lot of supports that are below 50%, and a lot of them are floating around 50 or 51. You might say, okay, well, that's good. That's balanced. It's like, yeah, but the problem is when you start looking at mid laners, right? They have a hell of a lot of stuff that's at 52 plus right um you start looking at junglers they have a hell of a lot of stuff that's 52 plus right now so it's like yes all the supports there aren't that many that stick out really far above the rest but the other roles at least mid jungle and to a lesser extent top lane all have multiple champions that are uh, much higher so anyways um <clears throat> some of the new changes and check out the official patch notes but just some of the impact these new changes might have on some champions we have gale force going to be a nerf to Jin. um so some of the all-in champs might be a little weaker if they you know really pair well with Jin in the early game but it is going to be a buff to champions that have skill shot ults bard is a huge one now they can't dodge your ult with gale force and that's a big one because bard is kind of slow his ult's pretty predictable so if you have a flash or a dash you can pretty easily get out of it Right, and Leona to a lesser extent, you can dash out of Leona's with Gale Force. So anything that stops people from dashing is gonna be good um, for a lot of these supports that wanna be able to stick stick on the person and kill them. Then obviously things like Threshold, Blitz Hooks, and things like that. Um, I just say that like the ults are the most important ones because the cooldown went from 60 seconds to 90 seconds, and that might actually give you a small window with some of these ults, particularly like a Leona ult that's a very low cooldown. Um, to bait out their Gale Force with your first Leona ult, and then if it's on like a 60 second cooldown, then you'll have a 30 second window where you can ult them again before that Gale Force is off cooldown. So that's gonna be really big on those skill shot ult engage type of champs. The Mandate nerf, um, I think, is really overblown. There's gonna be a lot of people saying it's the death of Mandate. We'll see how it goes. I don't think it's gonna be that bad personally because if you think about how Mandate works, it still does its initial damage and they still have four seconds to trigger it to do the extra damage. So it's still gonna be doing, you know, something around like 50 plus, you know, whatever, uh, you know, 120 over here. So it's still gonna be doing 170 damage in like normal trading patterns, right? You hit them with a slow, your ally falls up, 170 damage, and it can still trigger on all of the enemies, right? So in a team fight, if you have AOE CC from Malachi, Rakan, um, Bartle, things like that you're still going to be doing you know over 500 damage somewhere between 500 to a thousand per team fight potentially um it's just if you hit them with multiple pieces of cc in a row and your ally never touches them then it's going to do less right so this is primarily aimed at like your cassiopeia with rylai's getting this who just spams spells or like your ash who is getting this you know the meme build with imperial mandate ash that's the stuff they're trying to stop. So yes, if you're Rakan, you go in with your R plus your W, you're probably gonna lose 50 damage on that combination now because it's unlikely that your ally is gonna hit him 
before that second W pops up, right? With Maokai, you know, if you engage with your W and then you Q them immediately before your ally follows up, yes, you're going to be losing a little bit of that damage there. Um, but in normal patterns, right, if you just CC them with like a Nami bubble and then your ally hits them, it still would have already gone on cooldown for six seconds. So then if you start hitting them with your E, it wouldn't give you the bonus damage anyways. So people are really blowing this out of proportion. I, a lot of people, you know, that I've heard talking about it. The minus 10, I think it's probably going to be about minus 10%, right? And if you're talking about like Malachi seeds and things like that, it's like unless you're stacking a bunch of seeds in a bush or they just keep running over the same seeds, um, you know, within six seconds, it's not going to affect the seed damage, right? Your first one's still going to do the damage. If they hit the second one, then it's going to do, you know, whatever, 50 less damage. But it already does base like 550 to 600 damage. It does 250 on the base, and then it's 16% of their max health, which is a lot, right? If they have 2,000 max health, that's 320. Um, so that's, you know, 590, I think, damage, right? Um, maybe 610, whatever it is, like 600 damage. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. Outside of the meme builds like the Ash, Cassiopeia, I think it's going to be very, very similar damage in most practical situations. So I don't think it's the death of Mandate. It is a very slight nerf that I don't think is really going to impact its place in the meta at all. Kim Tank and Frost Buffs, and I do want to go. I don't want to spend too long talking about this, but it's going to be okay. I don't think it's going to matter a lot for most champions. Alistar is going to like it because he already runs Kim Tank sometimes. It's possible maybe you get Frostfire on, like, Leona, maybe. But I still think that um, Locket is going to be the de facto item that you're going to get most of the time. Kim Tank on someone like Galio might be interesting. Um... I'd have to think about that a little bit more, but that would allow you to potentially like run in and charge up your um, your taunt and get people with it. So that could be kind of cool. So we'll see. It might shake it up a little bit. Maybe um, like Frostfire on Rel or something just to hold people still because you move like a tortoise <laughs> when you're dismounted. So there will be some people that find some useful stuff. It's still going to be 2,800 gold. That's still 300 more than Locket. So we'll see. It'll be interesting. Essence Reaver, I think, will be a very big deal. I think Sivir's going to be very good. Uh, well, better. I think all these champs will go up probably like 2 maybe 3%. Ash is already pretty good. Um, Lucian seems like he should be good, but he has a 48% win rate. But anyways, all these champs will go up a bit. I'll talk about that more in my um, ADC tier list. And then Shirelia's is a pretty big buff. Now it has the exact same stats as Mandate and Moonstone. It's got the 40 AP and all that. But now you get that active for the movement. Um, so that's going to be better if you are going for just like a hard engaged team fight type of comp, especially on someone like Rakan or Bard, who really want to help your team reposition to take advantage of their engage. Um, but you're not going to have the same skirmish potential as Mandate because Mandate is only a six second cooldown and it's a per target cooldown. So if you're just running around with the jungler ganking people a lot, or just running around goon squatting through the jungle, like running people down, Mandate's going to be a lot better. And that's what a lot of solo queue is, is picking people off and running stuff down. But it, like with proper team fights, maybe Shirelia's is a little bit better. So it's obviously going to get better if you have like an Olaf or a Darius or something like uh, Hecarim on your team that really wants to run in there and benefits a lot from the movement speed. It could be very good. So I don't think it's going to be like must build on everybody, but there will be some situations where it could be pretty good. Okay, let's go ahead and get in here. Like I said, I don't want to spend too long, but I did just want to go over that because there are so, quite a few things on this patch that could really shake up the meta. It, oh, as far as champions themselves, um, Galio is really the only mainstream support that's getting nerfed here. So his E cost is going... Now, it's still 60 at lower levels, but at later levels, it's going to 100. That's his seed. Um, the damage ratio is 1% per 100 AP going down to 0.8 per 100 AP. I don't think this is going to matter. Um, the mana, like if you cast five seeds, that's 100 mana. Usually I'm not running that short on mana when I play Galio support, but if you are, you could just take um, the Frost Fang instead of Relic Shield early, and that'll give you an extra 100% mana regen eventually. So that could help out. Um, you can take Biscuits, which is handy. Uh, so I think there are other places that you can, like, you're probably still going to go Mandate, which has 100% mana regen. Like, there are places you can go to get more mana, I think. So I don't feel like it's going to be a big deal, but we'll see. 
Um, and then the ratio just doesn't matter. Most of the time, you know, in a lot of games, you're going to have mandate and maybe one other mana item. So, you know, you might have like 120 or something AP. So, you know, losing that extra whatever percentage on there is not going to be a big deal. Like two tenths of a percent. That's like 20 damage per thousand. It's not even that much. Like that, that does double. So, um, if the seed is in a bush, so instead of getting a 2% bonus, you're getting a 1.6. So I guess it's a loss of a 0.4. It's like four per thousand health damage that you're losing um, for every 100 AP. So if you have 200 AP, it's eight per thousand. So if they have 2000 HP, you're losing 16 damage. And I just said it was like doing 600 damage per seed, not including the mandate um, damage on it. That's saying mandate does zero damage. So it's a joke. <laughs> it still does 16% base. Just because you're knocking off 0.2 off of its scaling is not gonna be that big of a deal i don't think so i think he's still gonna be extremely good in fact he's the number one on my list so that's a good transition into there galio is fantastic i've had amazing win rates with him lately um and he has been pretty good for a while i know that della or delub is uh you know has been telling me about malachi support and i think he has been good for a while but i think also that other champs have been nerfed and the there's fewer tanks being played and i think he's very good into squishy champs um so let me let me pull him up here real quick um so there's a couple of things that make malachi um really strong right now so the first one are the seeds that i just mentioned and this is something that makes him very very unique for most other champions in the game is that uh these are extremely strong like i said it's 16 percent max health damage aoe it can hit multiple people um with a 250 base damage um on a 10 second cooldown and it has 1100 range and it lasts for like over 30 seconds it's 30 seconds base and scales on your health and it runs after them unlike demo shrooms at like you know probably 440 movement speed if you have like sork boots it's just nuts like it scouts for you so it's almost impossible to sneak up on maokai and he just he controls every objective you just you cannot deal with these seeds late game it doesn't even matter like there are so many times where we'll just have a really weak lane or somebody's feeding we even won a 4v5 yesterday like literal 4v5 our adc just like quit at like 10 minutes in the game and i still won um because of these seeds like they do a ton of damage they scout for you it's a low cooldown it's not uncommon to see maokai do like the second most damage in the game like you're not going to do as much damage in most games as like you know your four item vladimir or something like that right the person who like is like super fed on your team but you will do a lot of damage a surprising amount of damage just because of these seeds so it's vision it's damage <clears throat> it's zone of control it's basically like a ward meets like poke all rolled into one so it's extremely powerful and it provides a nice slow so if you're chasing people down on a gank, you don't have to throw it in a bush. You just throw it ahead of them. It's 1,100 range, right? They flash away. Just throw the sapling ahead of them. It slows them by 35% for two seconds. Um, so that's really good for running people down as well. So this ability is just extremely strong. Very, very good. He's the king of vision um, and also one of the kings of damage. Like He's right up there with Brandon Zyra. He's just way safer and just provides a lot more utility. Um, Twisted Advance, very, very strong piece of CC because they can't outplay it, right? They can't Gale Force out of this. They can't Flash out of it. They can't Dash out of it. Nothing. You get them. You press W on them, you get them. They have to be careful because they can pull you under tower. I had somebody yesterday, like, Gale Force and then Flash and pull me, like, a thousand units like into their tower, which I was not happy about that. But um, So you got to be careful with that one but it's really really nice it comes down to a nine second cooldown which isn't the least in the world but considering that it's basically point click can't miss and it eventually goes to a 1.4 root duration extremely strong not great damage okay damage on the 170 but with these seeds you don't need to do a lot of damage 
um, with the rest of your ability. So that's good. And then Bramble Smash, so you max the seeds first, then you go for W second just to get the lower cooldown and the the more um, root duration. And then Bramble Smash is okay. They did nerf the damage on this quite a bit. It used to go up to like 280 or something, I think. Um, but he was too strong in top lane, so they nerfed it. So you can just put one point in this. And it's a decent little slow you can apply, and it can um, displace people who are trying to engage. So you have like a Zach trying to jump on your AD carry, or Lee Sin trying to connect with a Q, or Leona trying to connect with her E, or Alistar trying to headbutt, Jarvan trying to flag and drag. Anything that can be disrupted by like a Sura by a Janna Tornado, it can be Bramble Smash. So it's a really nice piece of utility. Stops, um, channels, so like Katarina, Nunu, stuff like that. Uh, Malzahar ult. It's got really good utility. Just for one point, it's okay. <clears throat> you have some healing in lane, so if you are taking some harassment, he naturally has pretty high base stats as well. So 565 is not crazy, but it's more than Enchanters. It's more than like Brandon Zyra. Um, decent uh, mana reach. And he has a pretty high mana pool too. We'll talk about Leona. She's my number two. You'll notice her mana pool, she starts at like 300 or something mana. He gets 375 and goes up to 1100. That's a really high base mana pool. And that's why I don't think these like the seed's going to be a problem. Because you have the mana regen off a of mandate. And you also just have really high base mana. So I, I think it's it's not going to be a big deal. And then your ultimate is huge as well. It's kind of awkward. You can't really start fights with it. Um, but it, it's a 2.6 second piece of CC if it hits him from 1,000 range. That's almost a Morgana Q that's like huge AoE. Um, so once again, the damage is not insane on it. It's okay, but it's a very, very nice piece of CC for team fights. Once people just get involved in the fight, you just throw these roots, and if they don't run, they pretty much lose the fight. So it's very, very good. So he doesn't have the traditional engage that I'm going to talk about with some of these other champs, but the fact that like you can just basically just run out all the vision. They can't ever contest you unless they want to walk through these seeds. And then this Dew Baron or Dew Dragon or whatever, if they want to come fight you for it, they're going to walk through the seeds, and they're going to come in at like 25% health. You just throw Nature's Grasp. And they either have to leave and give you the objective or stay and die. Um, it's it's really, really difficult to deal with him um, late game, especially if you don't have a tank. If they have a big body tank, you know, like a Sejuani with a lot of magic resist or something like that, they might be able to walk through the seeds. And if they have like a Yumi healing them or a Soraka or something, yeah, maybe they can walk through the seeds and get there. But with most comps right now, just running all of these assassins and just squishy champs, it's not happening. So that's why I think he's he's my number one overall. It's just the seeds are just too difficult to deal with, and he just has so much CC, and that's what separates him from something like Zyra and Brand. He's hard to kill. He takes aftershock. You can I've had people ask me about Comet or Aerie. You can do that, but one of the big strengths of him is he can't be assassinated very easily, right? Zed jumps on you. You just W M, you know, and you're gonna have aftershock to block a lot of the damage. You're gonna have high base health. His items give him a lot of damage too, man, or a decent amount of health, right? Mandate's going to give you 200. And then if you get something like um, Morellonomicon, that's 300. Or I think Demonic Embrace is also 300. Um, and then if you take Relic Shield, that's going to be another like 300-ish. So you usually have over 3,000 health off of two big items on him. So he's difficult to kill for a mage who puts out that much damage effectively. And that's what really makes him uh, unique. I think so I would definitely go with the aftershock version but yeah it's super powerful champion right now so just aftershock demolish I actually like font font can heal for a thousand ish health in team fights because you know you have so much AoE with your ultimate and your seeds um, you can put that up a lot I really do not like bone plating either um, so you can do conditioning if you want some later game tankiness or you can go for I've been doing second wind more often people often pick poke and this thing can heal you up for several hundred health during the laning phase off of second wind. Then you have your passive to also heal you up a little bit. Then you can take biscuits. So you can actually be pretty resilient against like your karmas and your namis and stuff like that. And you just have high base health and high regen, high magic resist. Um, 
Overgrowth is good. And then you can go footwear and biscuits. Now, I really like footwear on him because you're not going to be roaming and ganking that much early. And because your second item is kind of expensive, usually it's Merlinomicon or Demonic Embrace, then saving that extra 300 gold is pretty nice. You don't need your ult cooldown off of like Ulti Hunter. It's nice, but really the seeds are the main attraction. You're not just spamming your ult when it's off cooldown to make a play. Um, so I really like this. You can go Hex Flash if you want to be a little bit more aggressive. If you're going a tankier version, Hex Flash is good to flash out of a bush and get in range for your W. But you really don't need to engage. Like The seeds will just force the fights around objectives. And then I like this one. Sork Boots, Mandate, uh, Demonic Embrace, or Morellonomicon. Or you can go for something like Swifty's Locket, Dead Man, Zeke's. Maybe this, but I think that this Sork Boot build is really, really strong, and this is what I would go with most of the time. Now, I've been getting Morellonomicon more than Demonic Embrace early on just because Oblivion Orb is so strong. You really need anti-healing, and he can get it without sacrificing anything. He really doesn't need the mana that much, and he loves having the health anyways to build into Morello. Um, so that's that's going to help out your team a lot because then your mid laner doesn't have to build um, the Rel and Omicon in theory so they can get a higher damage item but yeah very very strong champion right now overall but we'll go ahead and move on because I do want to make sure that we touch on um, several champs here okay Leona is another one that um, I think is very very good right now and a lot of this just comes down to her cooldowns are just way way too low she does too much damage and her cooldowns are too low compared to a lot of other tanks out there so if you want an engaged tank she is the premier best engaged tank that you can have right now and she's going to have really high base stats as well. The 576, 8.5 regen, 47 armor. That's real big on the armor. Um, so she is not only like high damage, low cooldown, but also the tankiest early game tank, or certainly in the conversation. And a lot of it has to do with Eclipse, which is what you max first, because it has this flat damage reduction. So after... Um, it can reduce up to 50% of the damage... Uh, before armor is checked. Um, gains bonus armor, magic resist, taking reduced pre-mitigation damage. So this is so good against things like minions. When you go all in, early game, level 2 or something, you're getting beaten on by those ranged minions. I don't remember exactly how much they do. It's like 20 damage or something a shot. That adds up. And a lot of champs, you know, can completely get blown out by that. But even just having, like, at level 3, just that 8 flat reduction is massive. It helps you just face tank minions for days. It's so strong in the early game. And there's so many just random things that do small chip damage to you, right? Like enemy auto attacks, Scorch, airy, um, any kind of dot stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of pets, of so like Zyra plants. Um, there's so many different things that just do little small pieces of damage and just having that flat amount, not percentage, but flat is huge in the early game especially. And then later on, she just gets these free resistances, right? She gets 40-40 and then you get a 20% of your bonus magic resist and armor. Well, guess what Aftershock gives you? A lot of bonus armor and magic resist. Oh, this also gives you extra bonus and magic resist? Guess what Aftershock scales with? bonus armor and magic resist so they synergize with each other perfectly it's so op like you cannot kill her <laughs> uh, at a certain point because aftershock and eclipse scale off of each other it's not like an infinite loop but they both buff each other tremendously um in the early game she's going to be rocking like 150 150 or higher um with aftershock and it does pretty good damage. You gotta remember, this is AoE, so early game, this is 130 AoE, and you get sunlight procs, right? So if it's like level five or something, then each person that you hit is doing 50 extra damage. So her numbers on the damage look low, but that's because people forget to count the sunlight, right? So this is really 180 at level three, which is a lot. And then at 200, you know, if your sunlight's dealing 100, that's gonna be 300 damage, right? So like, you know, level 12 or whatever, that's 300 AoE damage. So, And this doesn't have a cooldown. You can trigger these sunlight procs if you go all in on someone and trigger this two or three times on the same person. So it actually puts out a shocking amount of damage. Um, especially in team fights, if you're hitting multiple people with your W, with your ult, your zenith blade, if you're going through two or three people, <clears throat> it does a lot of damage. So she's very tanky, a lot of damage, and those low cooldowns, one point in your Q... It's a five second cooldown, like basically point click. You can't miss one second stun. Um, so like if you get to 
you know, 30% cooldown reduction, which is not that hard to do, right? Then this is gonna end up being something like a three and a half second cooldown on this. They're stunned for one second. And if you combine that with your Zenith Blade, which can go down to six seconds, this is what you max second, you know, this is gonna be four seconds. You know, your other thing is gonna be three and a half seconds and they're gonna be stunned for like two seconds of that. I mean, you can almost stun lock someone like for over half of the time <laughs> that they're available. And this stuff gets around tenacity a lot. I saw some misinformation out there the other day where someone was like, oh, 95% tenacity, you can reduce, you know, such and such, like Ash Arrow down to a 0.25, you know, percent. No, it can never get reduced below 0.5, okay? Go look it up on Wiki, I'm not gonna do it right now. But the CC duration can never be reduced below a 0.5 duration. So when you have these low cooldown chip, you know, pieces of CC on like Leona or Nautilus, tenacity is not that great. It's okay, but tenacity is much better against something like an Ash Arrow that's a big, long cooldown, you know, long piece of CC. But these little things that are just like one second or half a second, tenacity literally does nothing against Zenith Blade because it's already at half a second. Um, so it's just really, really effective. And you can't dodge or like you can't hide from any of this, right? She can go through the minions anytime she wants with the Zenith Blade. So she can stand there and you can't hook her very easily with your Nautilus or your Blitzcrank or your Thresh, but she can hook you or your AD Carry with her Zenith Blade. Um, so she just presents a very large amount of threat. You can't hide it. You can't hide from it. Um, she can definitely back people off of the wave if she gets ahead. She's extremely impressive. And then her ultimate's a 90 second cooldown to start and goes all the way down to 60 seconds. So you can cast this so often, most other tanks, like competitive good tanks are like 120 second cooldown on their ultimate. So she basically starts off with 25%, you know, CDR on her ult compared to a lot of the other ones. Um, so she's just really strong and it has a very long range, right? It's 1200 range. So you can open on people from like a screen length away with this and they're gonna be stunned for one and a half seconds, which means you're gonna be able to get within that 900 most of the time in order to hit them with the E. So just huge opener. Once again, you can't hide from this either because um, it just drops down right on top of you. <clears throat> so, you know, Braum doesn't do anything against any of this. Yasuo's Windwall doesn't do anything against any of this. Um, Samira doesn't do anything against any of this. I think Samira's might actually block the E. Um, but it doesn't do anything against Solar Flare. So, super effective, tons of damage, very, very strong right now. You just get, I like Swifty Boots on her just because that allows you to keep moving in combat and stick to them and keep hitting them with more Shield of Daybreaks. Um, and then just pretty much lock it Zeke's every game. Now, I like Zeke's a little bit more. Mana can be a problem with her in longer fights because she has a much lower mana pool than Malachi. She starts at 300 instead of 375. Um, and her mana regen is 6 versus Malachi's is 8 and Malachi gets mandate for the extra mana regen she doesn't get any mana regen so having Zeke's is nice to get that extra little bit of flat mana um, you can also do and it has 20% ability haste on it which is very good and health you can get Knight's Vow and I've tried that the stats are not as impressive it does help against assassins so if they have a really fed Zed or something like it can still be very useful but um I still like Zeke's quite a bit. Okay, so Leona, super strong. Shouldn't be a big surprise to a lot of people on the Leona pick. And then just, um, once again, I don't really like bone plating that much. Unflinching is a pretty decent option too. Um, if you're against poke champs, I think second win's pretty good. Now, ulti hunter is pretty good with her because um, like you do want to use your ult every time it's off cooldown to do something. But other things I've been doing is I think that... Um, Biscuits are very nice. It does give you 150 extra mana permanently off of using Biscuits, which is good. And then you can go for either Hex Flash or Cosmic Insight. I kind of like Cosmic Insight because it lowers the cooldown on your Locket, which is a very, very nice tool um, in a team fight. And it also means that you get um, more Ignites, more Flashes, all that kind of stuff to make more plays. It just allows you to be more proactive. So I like it a lot. And then... Um, Swiftness, Locket, Zeke's, good to go. And then, of course, Relic Shield. 
You can do the AD version if you want. It's like maybe better at level two, but I, she has AP ratio, so I'd rather just go with Relic um, for the mid to late game. Okay, and Seraphine is someone that I'm bumping up here quite a lot right now, and the main reason is I think that she works very well. She's, I think she's the premier poke champion right now because she can also engage very comfortably. So I think she's just a much better version of something like Lux or Sona. I know that's kind of the meme with the Sona. I think she's a lot closer to Lux than Sona. Though she has a couple of things going for her. Um, and this is if we start to see like Sivir come out a little bit more or just like these Essence Reaver champs like Ash that are just gonna like constantly push in the waves and just spam mana, you know, on people, then she's gonna be pretty good in that environment. And they did, you know, slightly nerf Mandate um, slightly nerf Malachi support, who's, you know, a top end support. So that means she is going to be a little bit stronger. So she is, you know, going to be squishy, but she has very good poke with her W, with her E, you know, has a pretty good root, um, good team fight ultimate. Uh, and really this, like just her ranges, the 1200 range to be able to start a fight comfortably. She can peel, but she can also start a fight with that. It is kind of slow. You have to get used to the particle on it. But she can start those fights. Very good in team fights. Um, if you combine this, if you hit them with Encore and then Beat Drop, it pretty much guarantees your Beat Drop is going to get that stun because they're already going to be immobilized. So if you chain that together properly, you know you can get about two and a half seconds of CC AOE, which is a lot. Um, so you got to get used to it. But I think that she can be very good, and she can go for Moonstone plus Staff of Flowing Water, which puts out a lot of extra healing and gives your team a lot of extra mobility and movement. Um, so I think that she's going to be one of the premier um, Moonstone Flowing Water people. And then she can take Guardian as well to help her out against Assassins because if she has a shield from anywhere, then her surround sound is going to trigger um, the healing portion. Second, um, if she already had a shield at the time of the cast... Uh, then it's going to heal. So you're going to get the shield off of this, but you're also going to get a heal. Um, oh, after its effect ends, if she already had a shield at the time. Okay, so you don't have to have like the the double buff or whatever it is. You can just instantly, even if you don't have it queued up for the empowered version, you can still get the heal after it. So that's pretty good. And it just makes you harder to kill. You can also do this with Guardian and you can take Barrier. Barrier also is a shield that counts towards Surround Sound to heal you. So it's actually pretty hard to blow you up potentially through Surround Sound, Guardian, and Barrier. It does give you that extra little bit of tankiness. Not as tanky as Leona or Maokai, but it's still going to be pretty decent. Um, so I think she's going to be a, a pretty good option. Then after Staff of Flowing Water, you can either get, you know, Redemption, Ardent Sensor, uh, Mikhail's, whatever you think is going to help out the most. But I think if Sivir's just pushing them in tower the whole time and you're just sitting there taking pot shots at him, I think she's very, very good at that. Just because she does have the... And they, they also did um, buff up Ionian Boots, which are pretty good for Enchanters as well. Now you get 20 Ability Haste off of it which is going to be pretty handy. Okay, and then um, Rakan, I still have up here. Now, he has a lower win rate right now. I think that Shirelia's will be a decent option on him, um, but I still think Mandate's going to be good in kind of skirmish type of metas. Ionian Boots, I believe, are very good on him because he does have long cooldowns. His E and his W, even at max rank, are 12 seconds, so it's kind of a feels bad. They are very powerful, but those long cooldowns can be a little bit rough. Um, and yeah I mean he has another option with the Shirelias uh, I think he, he's decent into things like Leona Maokai is an absolute nightmare definitely never pick him into Maokai but like if you need some hard engage and Leona is banned I would probably go towards Maokai now I have or um, Rakan rather I have played Rakan a lot more than you know probably your average Joe he's been my most played champion over time but I think some of these have definitely made him um, a bit stronger. Now, his thing is he can also go for uh, Staff of Flowing Water second, but also has an engage. So kind of, And his engage is much more reliable than Seraphine's, I think. Um, so if they don't have a lot of CC, and he's very good against Assassins too, because he can go for that mandate. He has his um, innate shield. 
He has Guardian as well, and he has a lot of mobility to dodge a lot of their stuff and reposition, and he can shield the person who gets engaged on, right? So if you're Zed, if Zed ults, you know, your ADC gen, like, you can actually shield in, and you might be able to save him if you ult, shield in, charm the Zed, knock him up, and then shield again, and then Guardian triggers, you know, you may have just prevented 600 damage on that gen, right, between your Guardian and your shields. So that could save him, right? Versus if you're Seraphine and the Zed goes in and casts all of his crap and then zips back out before you can ult or like CC him, um, then that's not going to help out, right? Or like Leona, you may not be able to CC him fast enough, right? If he flashes your E or something like that or flashes your ult, you may not be able to catch him. So some of these really sneaky um, assassins are like if a Fizz hits your AD carry with a fish and then jumps up on the pole... You know, you're not going to be able to CC him before he lands and blows up your AD carry. But with Rakan, you might be able to save him, right? You're going to be getting hit by the fish and the E as well. So, you know, you've got to make sure you don't give the Fizz a double kill off of that. But you might be able to do something about it, right? Versus a lot of other champs can't. So the fact that he has engage and a shield, really good itemization options um, is nice. And he's okay against some of these like poke lanes. He can kind of survive, right? He's got the shield that comes back in. You can take second win. He can like hit some of his Qs and maybe heal back in. So <clears throat> I think there are a lot of situations where he certainly can be pretty good, especially if things like Maokai and Leona end up getting banned and you're starting to pull in the second string. I think he can be pretty, pretty powerful. And then Bard's one of the other ones that I'll mention here. And I, I bumped Bard up from Tier 2 to Tier 1 off of the Gale Force nerf and the Shirelia's buff. Um, Gale Force is one of the main reasons I quit uh, trying out Bard as much, just because they just dodge it. There are so many champions that have dashes as well. So if we do start to see more Lucian with Essence Reaver all the time bottom, um, or if there's a, like a really good Ezreal build with Essence Reaver and some other stuff that I don't know about, then it, it can be kind of rough. But if we start seeing more of these like squishy ADCs that don't have an answer, Sivir's also very good against Bard. Um, but if you start seeing more like Jinx's Ashes, you know, stuff like that, Jin, um, then they can be sitting ducks for Bard and his ultimate. But Bard puts up decent damage. Now, Mandate, you know, if you do, if you're like solo trying to kill somebody and you're hitting multiple auto attacks on them for multiple Mandate procs, yes. Um, you know, that's going to be lower. But if it's in a team fight situation, it's going to be less. And like I said, Shirelli's is pretty good. And you can even just go lock it if you just want to be a tanky or bard and just go like lock it, um, Dead Man's Plate or something like that. Then you can serve as sort of an off tank, engage type of champ that's just really mobile and has some decent CC. So he's got a lot of options to him. Um, and especially because everybody just has one or two items now, he doesn't get outscaled as hard as he used to by some of the enchanters. So I think he's he's a pretty solid option. It does really, really hurt not having Athenes because your W just feels worthless now. It just does not heal for very much with the point click. So he really, really liked Athenes. And I think the old Dead Man's was better also, just having more armor, even if it was a little bit less speed, because you're already pretty fast, like with Moby Boots. Um so and then of course like the the rapid fire like you can't go like you know dead man's in a rapid fire cannon as easily as you used to so he's his itemization still not amazing but it's okay and i will say i've heard some people saying oh well, why don't they like moonstone bard moonstone recon i don't think you want to do that because moonstone is really for like longer fights they don't recon does like the plus healing and shielding but he's not constantly like auto attacking or staying in combat like he wants to go in engage on someone and they die like he doesn't want super long fights right and so having the extra damage from mandate or from shirelia's or something is is kind of what you want versus someone like seraphine doesn't mind having the longer fights because she has really long range poke she can just keep hitting people with the poke it'll keep the renew you know ticking um and yeah, she just has the range and she has the ultimate. Like her kit just works better with Moonstone Renewer, I think, than something like Rakan or Bard does. You can try it, but um, I just don't think it's going to work out as well. So that's just someone else who's pretty good. I moved him down a little bit to tier two. He is kind of vulnerable to poke if you don't land your hooks a lot. So, you know, if he's sitting under tower against something like a Sivir, Seraphine, you know, staring him down, that's going to feel bad. 
Um, he has benefited quite a bit from the plus heal or from the ability haste changes, right? Because he really, really loves ability haste on his hook because he has that flat three second cooldown reduction um, if you hit a target with it. So if you can take it down from you know twelve seconds down to a base of eight seconds, then it gets reduced by three when you hook somebody. It's like a five second cooldown on a hook, which is very nice. Um, in team fights, so he still has all that utility. He's got the hook. He's got the lantern. You know his his ultimate honestly is a little underwhelming. That's one of the main reasons I get a little frustrated playing him. It's like it does have a slow. It does do some damage, but it's just it's not that hard lockdown CC. Same thing with Flay. It's like okay, you can displace people a little bit, kind of like a Maokai Q. Um, it's like it's all right, but it's not a very long piece of CC. Right, like Leona's gonna chain CC someone for like four seconds if she hits her ult and goes in on him, right? Maybe not, it's three seconds. Uh, but it, it feels like forever, and it's really low cooldowns, and she's just gonna stick to you and keep blasting you, right? Um, someone like Maokai, right? Like 2.6 seconds off of you know his ultimate hitting someone. That's not including his W for an extra 1.4. So Maokai literally can walk you up for four seconds um, if he wants to. So all of them have that, and it's like, you know, with Thresh, it's one and a half seconds on the hook, you know, maybe a quarter of a second on the flay, one second on the ult, I believe. It might be two seconds slow on the ult. So it's okay. I just feel like it's not as much CC, but you're trading that raw CC for utility, right? You have the lantern, which can be used offensively or defensively. Flay is a displacement, right? Leona doesn't have a displacement, so she can't stop the Zac from flying in on top of your AD carry. Um, so it's a trade-off. And he's just really hard to play, right? Like, his hook is very slender. It has a half a second wind-up time. Like, a lot of people can dodge those hooks, right? Unless you're doing no-look hooks or you're hook hooking people out of bushes or you're anticipating where they're going to walk. It's a really hard hook to land compared to something like, you know, Blitzcrank or Nautilus or even Leona. Um, those are going to be a lot easier to land, I think. So... He's okay. Um, so his, his damage is pretty good early. He's he's kind of squishy, though, earlier, too, right? Like, if you get into an all-in, like, you know, fist fight with Leona, assuming that both of your AD carries are playing something decent in the early game, she's going to beat you up. Like, you can flay back her E if you're fast enough with it, but she still is going to be so tanky with that W, and, you know... If she can still walk up and just auto attack and stun you with her Q, too, right? Just because you knocked her back off the flay, it still did the damage, right? The E still did the damage to you. She just has to take one extra step to hit you with her Q. So, I don't know. That matchup is not as good for Thresh as it used to be. It's a lot closer than it used to be. So, Thresh is no longer a hard counter to Leona just because she just has so much raw power after they reworked her W to just basically make her invincible in the early game. So, he's okay. I just, I don't know the matchups where he, like, some stuff, like I said, the Leona used to be a great matchup. Now it's like, okay, Rakan's okay if you can outplay him. Not a lot of people are even playing Rakan right now. Maokai, I feel, is a terrible matchup for you. Late game. Seraphine, if you get a hold of her, obviously you can kill her, but he's all right. He does like a lot of the, the new cooldown, you know, stuff. He loves Locket. You can go Locket and Redemption and just have, like, this magnificent team fight presence. So he does have some stuff that's pretty good, um, which is why I have him, like, pretty high on Tier 2. I just feel like his engage is just, it's sketchier, right? You have to hit the hook. You don't have, like, the Bartle, the Reconnell, Leona ult. Like, it's just a little bit more conditional. <clears throat> All right, last uh, last few here. We have Nami. Um, so Nami is still going to be one of the premier enchanters in the bot lane. And why Nami is sort of thriving a little bit more than some of the other enchanters is that she brings a lot more to the table in the early game, especially with her bubble. If you can land that, that's a 1.5 second potential AoE CC knockup. Um, so that's really big. Most other enchanters don't have that kind of CC in the early game, especially for one point. And it can go through minions. Right, so it's a little weird. You gotta like land it on top of them rather than like a line skill shot. But if she lands that, she can probably kill people. And she does have really good trading with her W as well. Because it not only does damage to them, but bounces back and heals you at the same time. So that's really good, especially if they don't have like any hard engage. So you're not facing Leona. 
if you're facing something like a seraphine or um, uh, like a Janna, a Lulu or something like that, you can go up and bully them early on uh, if you can get into that W range. So that is pretty nice. Um, and then her E is fantastic with uh, Mandate, right? Because you just put that slow on somebody and then if they, um, you know, auto attack or whatever, it's going to apply the slow and then it's going to apply the damage as well. So, but they're already triggering that mandate once so it's not going to apply those multiple stacks of mandate um off of the e if someone's auto attacking someone else down it will trigger it once though off of just one e and it's going to give that movement speed so the mandate gives the movement speed her passive also gives movement speed and so it just kind of doubles down on this like battle manipulation type of mage, right? Where you're slowing people down with your E, your bubble, your ult, and you're also speeding up your allies to make the most of that. Um, so she's still pretty good. She was like a few patches ago, like 54% or something like that, maybe 53%. So she's definitely gone down a little bit, um, but I still think she's going to be pretty good just because she does have a stronger early game than some other ones. And I do think that Mandate will still be the go-to on her just because it is so good with her E. Um, Galio is another one who has been seeing some pro presence. Now, I will say, um, and you if you might be wondering the conspicuous absence of Alistar as well because you see him all the time in pro and he's fairly popular in solo queue. He's the, like, the biggest bait support in pro right now and Galio is number two. But he's got a 42% win rate after 114 games from every region in pro. So it's like you see him a lot, but he's just awful. He's just really bad <laughs> right now in pro. And I think, well, we'll talk we'll talk about Al Alistar in a second, but that's why he's missing. Let's talk about Galio here first. I don't want to go too far out of order, but I will get to Alistar in a second. But Galio is kind of a bait champion too at 45%. Um, and I've tried him, and it, it's hard to put your finger. I think a lot of it is just he just doesn't have a reliable engage. He's just a peeler tank, and it's rough. Now, he does have some nice qualities. A lot of people are maxing the W, which they did nerf a few patches ago. But it's it's got a big AOE CC, does some respectable damage, gives you some extra tankiness, gives you a shield, a passive shield. So that's all good. His Justice Punch is a little slow, but it can be a potential AOE knockup pretty decent damage the q is very very lackluster if you don't put a lot of points in it most galios are not doing that they're just putting one point in it um and your ult is nice but like someone has to be in the right position they have to be ready to follow up um so you know it, it, it does have a lot of potential there with certain combinations right if you have a camille or a jarvan or just something else that can go in there but you're kind of waiting on your allies to make the play for you um, and now you can just like just ultra eighty carry if they get engaged on by Leona or something like. There's always a place where you can use it, but it's a really long cooldown too. I think it's like 180 seconds. It's either 160 or 180 seconds early on. So his damage is kind of high, but I don't know. I mean, we'll see. Maybe he deserves to be a little bit higher uh, if he can use like Kim Tank or something and getting closer for those taunts. It just feels like he's a bit more conditional. Right, like you can't just say like go, pull the trigger, and just like start a fight, and you know take advantage of them mispositioning or whatever. And so that's why I have him a little bit lower. I think he's probably one of the best peeler tanks out there, just because his damage is high and his CC is high. Like he has a lot of utility. Um, so I would definitely put him over something like Taric right now, in my mind at least, probably over Rel. Um, but he's still a little problematic. <clears throat> Yumi is another one who I think is pretty strong right now. Now, Yumi, if you can get away with the laning phase, so if you don't die and you get into the mid game, if anyone on your team is doing well, it just amplifies it so much, you know, because you've got Moonstone, you have Staff Flowing Water, you can't be targeted. So if you just hop on a tanky person, you're going to be tanky, you know, late game. So it kind of fixes the assassination problem. Your vision game is pretty terrible. Because it's very hard to go ward by yourself. And even if you have someone with you, it's possible to get caught out. So that can be kind of rough. Um, but just the fact that you can speed people up with your E. Um, you've got a huge AoE um, ultimate, which is pretty nice. 
you give people extra attack speed, you give people extra, you know, um, AP or AD. So she just is like the premier in like pure enchanter, like hard buff them up type of champ, but it's at a very heavy price. Your mana management early is awful. You have to take some pretty questionable runes just to even like function like presence of mind, which has been like mega nerfed. Um, and you're just extremely vulnerable to all in champs, and you can just get snowballed on so hard early. Now, if they don't close the game, I've seen some Yumi's go like 0 and 8 in the lane, and they just take over later. But once again, you're kind of putting yourself at the whim of your allies. They have to be doing well um, in order for you to amplify them. So she is supremely powerful in the right situation, and she can feel really OP, but it's, it's very dangerous if you don't get to that point. And then Janna's one of the last ones that I'll mention here. She's still pretty good. You know, you just W spam on people with Mandate. I still think she'll run Mandate instead of Moonstone or anything like that. Um, maybe Shirelia sometimes, but you got the W spam for extra damage. You can rotate around the map really well. Very good with split pushers like a Camille. You can defend towers. Um, excellent disengage uh, with your ultimate. But the big issue, you just don't have an engage. And I just think that it's it's putting a lot of stress on your team. Because if your jungler goes something like Kha'Zix and your top lane goes Camille and you're Janna, you have no tanks, you have no engage. And that's like super common for a team comp like that to roll up. Um, so she's just, she's a lot better when the tanks are running wild. You know, when you're seeing the Sejuani's in the jungle and you're seeing, you know, top Malphite and stuff like that. She's going to be a lot better. But, um... Especially if it's just kind of farm off lanes bottom, but right now you really need to kill him. You really need to snowball. So that's why I just have her down just a little bit more. Um, and then Alistar, I uh, just mentioned him. You know, one of my big problems with Alistar is his ultimate just feels really outdated. Like Leona basically has his ultimate on her W. She's unkillable a lot of times with Aftershock plus her W. And so it just feels like you're lacking on the CC department. You can W cube. That's only a one second knockup. You have your E, which takes a while to charge up. You can get you know one more second stuns. So you have up to two seconds of CC. But you know Malachi's got four. Leona's got three. Nautilus can probably CC you for like four. So um, he feels very strong early game. You do have that roar, so you can take a trade and then heal back through it, which is nice. You can engage through the minions. You can roam around really well and try to make plays mid lane or invading the jungle. So he feels super strong off of like zero items and just like boots of mobility. He's very good. But then like later on, it starts to catch up. Once people get points and other abilities, um, they just start to outscale you. They just have more CC or better scaling or whatever. So he's very good at all those things I just mentioned. You know, tower diving early skirmishes early roaming you know all ins like super early but i feel like if you just don't close the game you just get out utility right the the enemy is just going to be more valuable than you are like at 20 minutes so i don't know i don't like being on the clock like that but they're you know he's getting picked a lot in pro even though he's not winning a lot um so he's okay and then nautilus um He's all right. I mean, the biggest thing for me with Nautilus is you can't hook through walls. So it just makes it a lot harder to find picks later on. Like, you can have really good vision, you know, like in the upper river area, but you just can't hook people over that wall to make the play. Like, you have to use your ult to do it. And even then, you don't have a lot of follow up unless you flash over the wall. I guess you can take like hex flash or something and like hex flash over the wall and fix that. So maybe that fixes a lot of his problems. But. He just feels a lot squishier, too, in the early game. Like, his W is pretty lackluster compared to, like, a Leona W. His engage range is a bit lower. Like, his ult's, like, 800, I think. It might be 900. So, I still think he's pretty good. You know, maybe he deserves to be Tier 2. Maybe that's a bit low. Maybe you could put him in there instead of Thresh. Because he does have that guaranteed undodgeable ult, which is nice. His hook does have a massive hitbox. So, um, it's very, very difficult to dodge. And it's really fast, too. Very low wind-up time. So... One thing also, though, is he is a mana hog, right? Like, his E is, like, 90 mana per pop for that little, um, you know, the little waves that he sends out. And it does good damage, but 90 mana is a lot. Because you got to remember, you don't have Presence of Mind anymore, right? You're not getting Zeke's probably until second item at the earliest, which means you're going to have, like, no mana regen early. And his mana regen is really low. So he's just going to go out of mana way faster than someone like Leona is. And Leona already kind of has problems with her mana off of stuff that just costs like 50 and 60 mana 
right? Her E and her Q. So Nautilus is definitely going to run out of mana. I haven't played him a lot in the preseason. I don't know for sure, but that would be a problem. So you definitely want to run Biscuits. Um, but I could see mana being a huge issue. Might be back to Q max instead of E max just for the sake of mana. But um, anyways. Okay, well, that's going to be it. We're pretty much out of time here. I do want to keep this under an hour. Uh, Soraka does get buffed on this patch, but there's still just too many Grievous Wounds for her, I think. Uh, Karma did get a significant buff last patch, but I feel like she just doesn't have enough CC right now. I could be wrong about that, especially if Sivir's really good. Historically, Karma's very good with these push-poke type of champs, so maybe we do see Karma creeping in with Sivir, but um, for now, I'm just going to keep her on the honorable mentions. But anyways, that's going to be it. Thank you very much. Have a good day, and we'll see you next time.